Kalecki and, and I'll ask them and Tim and I can answer them. So main question, whether a program grant is acceptable or whether it has to be for one specific project, um, given that it has to be completed within two years. I think terminology, my sense is terminology is tangled here. This is a two year project and it needs to be finished in two years. What you call it, and there's a fixed amount of money, three, up to $350,000. So there's up to $350,000, um, there's two years. If you want to put two activities in there inside that project, that's your call. But I don't think we should be thinking of programs and projects. These are projects for what you components. Is that how you would set it up? Yeah, and I, I think we maybe uh, a helpful clarification there is that um, while we are looking for translation, ideally within a two year period, we know that that's not always going to be possible. Mm -hmm. So it may be that you're signaling as an applicant towards um, a post two year phase that is the next stage in, in that step along the translation pathway. Uh, which may be another project, um, but we would need to see that that pathway is is clearly evidenced and, and thought through. Um, but it would need to be a discrete project that has that two year time frame. Um, but potentially the, the full community impact may not be realised uh, until you know, potentially five to ten years away. Yeah, right. fair point. To, um, are minor amendments to registered title allowed, or is the title set in stone once registered? Uh, I might refer to Ryan. My sense is that would probably be acceptable unless it was a completely different title and, and maybe in a different domain. Ryan, do you have a Yeah, uh, that's pretty accurate, uh, Wayne. Basically, you, you can make minor amendments, but if it's grossly off the original topic or if it's in a completely different funding thing, then that won't be allowed. Yeah. Um, just because it makes it very difficult at our end, and that's the whole reason for the registration process in the first place. The, um, the, now, can the grant be utilised to fund supervisors' tents, um, i.e. the investigator or the principal investigator or another investigator's salary? And again, that is at the discretion of the principal investigator. The key thing is that you can't spend more than 350k and there are overheads to be applied. It's a slightly complicated formula. Um, so for better start, we're required to apply 112% um, for um, tertiary institutions, not sure about DHBs, what they apply. From the Cure Kids, they don't pay overheads. So what we end out with when we put the two together, if this makes sense, is 50% overheads against salaries. So we're talking about uh, approximately 56% on salaries. But, and as I, as I said, that may be different for DHBs that may pay a lot lower rate overheads. So I think, is that clear around overheads? Our project idea has come from the stakeholders themselves. They approach us to build a research evaluation around that. So our application should explain that in some detail. Yeah, I think that I'm not quite sure what you're actually asking me, Rose. Are you asking about, because from memory, Rose, you sit in the University of Otago, and if you were the PI and you had time on there, you'd pay overheads because it would be hosted by the University of Otago. And if you had any salaries on there, um, it would attract overheads. Um, Leif is typing, just while, until Leif finishes, I'll ask, the last question from the Taranaki group. What is the timeline for application and having it delivered on? So um, in terms of application and delivery, as Tim has said, the applications are due in on the 4th of April. Funding decisions will be made um, mid-year, approximately, uh, May, June. Um, and the projects need to be delivered upon, therefore, two years later. Now, what, you might ask, well, why two years and, and why don't we just get it? We'll ask for an extension, um, or we'll put in three years for the same money. We are required to report against the first five years of funding, which ends in mid-2019. So projects that straddle beyond that would be a problem for us. Now, coming back for... So Rose's question while Leith is typing, um, was there an even 
or uneven split with a registration. Um, very, quite uneven, quite uneven. But that do, do not assume that there will be, if we think of 350K, that's potentially eight, perhaps more projects funded if they're smaller. You don't have to put in an application for 350K if it costs less. Um, but don't assume there's two for each theme. It'll be based on, on quality. So from Leith, is it acceptable to have co-PIs, two principal investigators? Our most senior team members based in Australia, but our, our massive university team member would also need to be a PI. And the project will take place exclusively in New Zealand. Is there a problem with that? Um, I, there is, Leith, and we've been asked this question several times. Um, there needs to be a PI who is accountable and their institution accountable for the project. So my advice would be that the Australian-based person is an, is an investigator on the project, and that's certainly possible. But in terms of having co-PIs, it makes it more difficult to be able to contract and create accountability when it can be two people, potentially in two different departments in different institutions. There needs to be a single PI accountable for the project and their institution, uh, that the contract would be negotiated with their institution. And just uh, bringing that back to the question that was asked earlier around including attempts of, um, of contributing current investigators or PIs, that excludes international investigators. Yes, so it's only New Zealand based researchers that would, uh, researchers affiliated with a New Zealand institutional organisation uh, that can receive funding. As a point of principle, to follow on what Tim has just said, is that funding will not leave New Zealand. Um, if it transpires, however, that there was some uh, essay that you are trying to access, uh, this is theoretical, that is only available in Australia or in Iceland, then yes, the money could be sent to them to deliver that for you. But, but there isn't otherwise an expectation that there is uh, a significant amount of resource for the project that goes across to another country. Not quite. Okay, so a question from Steve. Would a fair summary of what Tim just said be that you will fund high quality translatable research, i.e. basic research with a potential for translation and no effort to translate within the project itself? Um, Steve, you, you need to have a very clear pathway how your research can and could be translated. Um, all of you will know, and I know you'll know, Steve, that when you go to the HRC, you can, and I'm making this up, um, you could have a study done in uh, bugs, or you could have a study done in mice, and then you could say, well, this unusual mouse model um, could work for obesity, and then it could be translated to humans, and eventually that could lead to an intervention for treatment of obesity. In other words, what you see is this very tortuous um, translatable pathway. Um, it, it, it couldn't. It, it would be unwise to have a tortuous translatable pathway. What do you think? Yeah, and I would think that the um, not just describing that pathway, but making it clear that you are in control of what that collaboration looked like as well. So it wouldn't be a get it to a certain point, and I'm sure somebody else could translate this uh, given their expertise. It would be um, these are the the endpoints of this two-year study. Uh, we then have a very clear pathway uh, with our collaborators or with this research team that would take it um, beyond this. And this is the being able to describe very clearly what that community impact is um, at, the, at that point if it is beyond the two-year time frame. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. Now, just coming back to that point, Steve, what we don't want to do, though, is to shackle innovation in there. And sometimes that's difficult putting innovation in something new and potentially exciting into translation because the two often seem to live far away but you do need to have a clear pathway but what we're not saying is um, innovation is going to be squashed out of this process because it's all community-based interventions and assessment.
Yes, it is. And as uh, Tim said, that's why you want a pathway. And of course, there is going to be a second uh, contestable funding round, which will be considerably larger still, probably twice as much money. And if we are and if the relationship continues to work well, and there's no reason why it, it couldn't, then we may well be having a future contestable round with Cure Kids, and that will be probably 2020. So work done here could see uh, a follow-on grant in the next contestable round. But the pathway does need to be translation. Uh, if it was a basic sciences project, it can't lead to another basic sciences project, and there's just this long sequence that doesn't get to creating change um, by the end of the 10 years, which is seven years away for us. So I would, I would encourage applicants to um, de-risk that for the assessors, because part of the, the, um, the discussions will be around uh, that impact, that translation, when it could happen. And if it's clear that there is, it isn't a capacity or expertise or a um, a pathway issue to that translation that actually if the research um, meets its objectives, if, if um, the pathway that you're anticipating eventuates, that actually you've thought about how this might be delivered, if you're aware of your teams, um, then that will de-risk that assessment and, and probably make it more likely to, to be supported in that aspect of the consideration. Now, Leith is typing furiously. Um, now, we need to just scroll up to catch all of your um, your message, Lee. Okay. Thank you for your answer to my earlier question. We are able to have a Massey University team member as a PI and funding remaining in New Zealand, but some of the expertise required comes from the Australian team member. Uh, Lee, that's absolutely fine. Um, are we able to provide CV details for more than one member in our application to show this is understood by the triage team? Yes, I think. Are we are we requiring in the full application how many CVs? Just one. Just one. Yeah. Um, look, in, in, in the application, Lee, you could explain something about the Australian team member. Uh, and certainly, if there are international collaborations for a project that strengthen it, then um, all the good to you and your project or your team's project. Uh, we're not excluding uh, international collaborators. And as you might well imagine, that can add to the, the, um, the strength of the research team. And the assessment panels will be instructed that they can uh, request additional CVs um, from contributors to the research project. So uh, my guess would be that if you flagged within the proposal that the Australian uh, team member, while they're not the PI, brings to the table some critical expertise. You can set that out within the application or even indicate that that CV is available and that, that may be requested. What we're trying to avoid there is ending up uh, with the assess assessment panel dealing with 102 times six um, CVs uh, when, in essence, they can um, take a lot from the PI and just the top level detail that we can't list the papers. Are there any other questions? Um, Sarah, Jane, Trish, are there any questions that you have? We've covered, or Laurie, Jordan, we've covered a number of questions, in fact, that we heard the other day. Uh, okay. Um, webinar, though, is on the website. Right. Um, the webinar, so we have three webinars and the audiences are all different and the questions, while there's some similarity in questions, there are differences. If you wanted to um, have a look at what those other questions might be in our responses, then it's on our respective websites, correct? It's on the, it's on, it's on the Better Start website. Yeah. So it's on the Better Start website. Uh, so again, if there are things you're not certain of, um, Similarly, if you get to the end of this process and then think, oh, I've got some more questions, um, I would suggest in the first instance that you email Ryan Chandler. Um, actually, what we should do is put your email address in the chat, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Ryan can direct your qu your query to the correct, to the appropriate uh, place. If you can't sorry, answer it in Sarah. I'd better start email. I'd better start. Oh, all right. So he will, he will type in his... Um, uh, his 
email address for this process for you. Jordan, would the PI have to be employed by the host institution? Um, yes, Jordan, the PI could be subcontracted by the host institution. A question we were asked before is could an applicant um, be self-employed, for example? And the answer to that is no. Uh, and by that I mean being self-employed is that that self-employed person actually holds the grant. And one of the things that Cure Kids and a Better Start would require is the confidence that a PI sits within uh, a financially um, accountable organisation or institution. So it doesn't just have to be a university, um, but it does need to be a financially um, accountable institution because theoretically I could put in a grant under Wayne Cutfield privately, I get 350k and then disappear to um, Barbados, never to be heard of again, <laughs> 350k richer. So institutions have a degree of accountability. Um, any other questions by the audience? Sarah Jane, is there anything or Laurie that you want to ask? Joanna, Jeanette, we have a number of participants. We've, we now have 10 participants. So what, what we will do is that we will stay online and when there are no questions coming for four or five minutes, we'll just close the session. But our experience has been they kind of trickle as you think. We're getting a question from Sarah Jane coming. It must be a long question, or she types as slowly as I do. Um, the answer is, I I'm assuming Sarah Jane, if it's a pilot, then it probably wouldn't be a 350k project. Um, because that would be a very expensive pilot. Um, the answer is yes, if you can demonstrate clear translation. In other words, it leads on to something else that will, will ultimately affect change. Um, so the answer is yes. And I think a question I've been asked by a number of people is, can we put in a proposal for less than 350k? And the answer is, of course you can. And some of the assessment is about value for money in a project that delivers uh, a very succinct, smaller project with some useful knowledge and translate, translation possible, uh, and it costs $50,000, then, yep, uh, that, that would be a strong proposal. It doesn't need to be for the full amount. Now, No problem. You're all very polite. So as Gilbert may have mentioned, and some of you have joined after the event, the webinar will be posted later on the Better Start website. Um, if you do want to go back and think, oh, what the answer to those questions, of course, all of you know that you're participating in the webinar, which will be on the website, or your questions are at least. If you're not comfortable with that, then uh, you know, don't ask questions or step away. Um, we asked that at the beginning, but several of you have joined afterwards. But I don't think this will be a problem for you. We're trying to make this as, as, as helpful as possible to as many people as possible. Okay, we're reaching a pause. We'll wait just a couple more minutes and if we have no more questions then we'll uh, thank you for um, 
signing into the webinar and joining us today. There is another one on Thursday. If you or any of your colleagues think, oh, we've got some more questions, you can register for that one as well. Each is beyond the initial introductory slides, um, which are largely scene setters and tips for you. Uh, the rest of it uh, is different and it depends on the audience. So the questions, of course, will vary depending upon who the participants are. Okay. Um, we've had a long pause now and no questions, so I think we've you've all run out of steam and I hope we've answered your questions. If you do have any further questions, then oh Trish. And the last bid coming in is coming from Trish. Oh thank you. Okay, we appreciate the thanks. And thank you, Steve. You're all very gracious. <laughs> Um, just to reiterate, and, and thank you for being such gracious participants, um, if, if you do have any further questions, um, email Ryan, you've got the email address, and he will direct it, if he can't answer it himself, and, and he'll answer most questions, he'll direct it at one of us who can and get back to you. Um, so one last thing I want to leave you with, give Vision Mataranga a lot of thought, because Traditionally, we're very good at diving into the science and spending all of our time sorting out every intricate detail of the science. And we think about engagement last. My strong advice to you is think about engagement first, because that can take a bit of time, a bit of planning, a bit of discussions and conversations, and then get on with the science. If you have a stakeholder that you want to work with, and you've spent three weeks building a really, really intricate design, and you go to the stakeholder saying, um, I'd like to work with you because you're a community, you're a Māori community stakeholder, and here's the plan, they may well say to you, hang on, hang on, you want me to del help deliver on your plan, so you don't want my input at all, you're just telling me what to do. So just be a bit cautious about that because sometimes stakeholders have got some really practical advice in terms of what it may mean to communities and what it means to them. Okay, look, thank you very much all, and um, good luck with the writing. <laughs>